Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hi, this is Michael Waits from Asia Tech Podcast Stories. I am talking to Jane Chan. Jane is the head of Start Me Up Hong Kong at Invest Hong Kong. Jane, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, not at all. Thank you so much for the invite. So do you want to talk to me a little bit about what Start Me Up Hong Kong is, and then maybe a little bit mm-hmm. as well about Invest Hong Kong, and then I just want to continue on to find out like what a startup gets and how they appreciate what you do for them when they decide to either start in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. expand to Hong Kong, all of the things mm-hmm. that Start Me Up Hong Kong does. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, I might do it the other way around, just so you can get a little bit more of the context. Sure. So um, Invest Hong Kong is actually a government department. Um, we are what's called an inward um, foreign direct investment agency. Oh, okay. So it's, you know, it's a whole lot of names and, and letters and words to basically say we're here to support overseas companies um, to basically set up in Hong Kong. And the kind of support we give ranges you know, something really basic like, um, you know, helping them with work visas, um, t- telling them how to register a company, what are the benefits of setting up in Hong Kong if you're looking to expand to Asia, for example. Um, so lots of pragmatic kind of advice. And also for certain industries, they may need to get licensing and things like that. We have nine sector teams in the Hong Kong office, as well as 30 offices around the world that provide that initial level of support. Um, the Start Me Up Hong Kong initiative is, is basically Invest Hong Kong's function to help the startup community. And by that, I don't mean just the startups themselves. So obviously, they make up the largest percentage of the people that we help, but also the you know the various stakeholders within that community. So we're talking about investors. We're talking about corporate innovation groups. We're talking about academia who may be involved in the innovation side of things. Basically, the people who are, you know, nurturing this whole ecosystem, these different people involved, we are very much on the front end of of providing that support. And we work alongside um, our sector team colleagues to provide startup specialised information. So, for example, if you want to know the best co-work spaces for your specific industry, you want to find out what kind of um, government funding is available, um, you want to get connected to different kind of industry groups, we're basically here to facilitate that. And in addition, apart from providing that very specific help, our other hat that we wear is actually to build the Hong Kong um, startup ecosystem. And that's when we get involved in a lot of, um, you know, different kind of events, our own events, as well as participating in other ones, trying to attract like the, the big companies to come over to Hong Kong, the event companies to try and grow this um, this ecosystem. So can you talk a little bit about how long as part of the Invest Hong Kong, which sounds like it's a very well developed and sort of a long standing you know, it's FDI, right? So foreign direct investment into Hong mm-hmm. Kong, which has been extremely yeah. important, obviously, for a while. Is the mm. is this Start Me Up Hong Kong, is that one of the verticals that sits inside of it? And if it is, how long is it, has it been there? Um, the actual, you know, Start Me Up team, when I joined Invest Hong Kong, was only about three years, basically. But the initiative was actually driven by my boss, um, Charles Ng, who's Associate Director General for Invest Hong Kong. And he basically started when he saw things happening in the market about five, six years ago. You know, we started seeing little clusters of startups doing things, but it was all very disconnected and very disparate. And um, he thought there was a fantastic opportunity to actually attract the best and the brightest companies to Hong Kong. And so he basically launched a, a startup competition about five years ago. Um, and we basically went on a roadshow to promote this around the world and to, you know, basically um, showcase Hong Kong startup ecosystem opportunities, but also to find these really innovative companies and say, look, why don't you come to Hong Kong, check it out. There's, there are like good business opportunities for certain sectors. Come and check it out and, um, you know, pitch in front of an audience of, of like several hundred people and, you know, just take it forward from there. And it basically started from there. When when Chow started doing this, you know, there was very little sort of like formalized kind of um, events, startup competitions and that kind of thing. Um, by the time we, you know, I came on board, you know, we were starting to see a lot more 
players getting involved. There were universities doing these kind of things. And frankly, the number of applications we had for the competition at our last count was 550 applications. Um, to have to go through all of that, we basically called on you know, the expertise of over 70 assessors. You can imagine the logistics of organising something like that. And because we're not directly the right people to, to look at the you know how good that specific business was, it was basically getting unsustainable. So we decided to move into another kind of format, which is where the, the festival came around. But in terms of the actual work that we did, that's been ongoing for yeah, for quite a few years actually, for about five years. Michael? I am here. Sorry. Yeah, look, I think it's pretty incredible that you got so many applications for people mm -hmm. to come and and present to you. And mm -hmm. I presume you went out, did you go to the sort of investment community, whether that included high net worth individual angel style investors or venture capital investors? I know a few funds that are in Hong Kong are people that I know well. Did they help participate in basically curating those? Or how did you, oh, how, how did you go yes. out and and sort of gets the 70 people that literally went through each one of those applications and tried to determine the ones that were good and bad. Yeah, I mean, literally, we, we, you know, we're very lucky in that Invest Hong Kong has been around for a while and um, we've got quite a lot of support of, um, you know, various investment groups and and, you know, um, experts within a specific domain um, already. And um, we were just incredibly lucky that they were prepared to come on board and, uh, you know, get involved because everyone saw it as something that's almost like a pay it forward kind of format because we all knew that there was something really quite fundamental happening. There was a shift happening. There was a great amount of momentum and there were all these wonderful tech startups that were starting to to you know, get set up, start to look at Hong Kong. And, um, you know, they just thought if they got involved, it basically helped to build the ecosystem. And frankly, you know, it would also basically help them in future as well if they participated in its growth. And so, you know, we did put a call out for it and there was a, a you know, a huge amount of support. But even just managing the logistics of that was, you know, was, was quite a big task sure. actually. But Sure. Can I ask a question? So there's been mm -hmm. there's been like an ongoing competition, I'd say, for the last I don't know thirty years. It seems to me, and I'm no expert, right? Right. Um, between Singapore and Hong Kong, for who's really the financial center that's either mm -hmm. a most closely associated with China, or b yeah. just who's the fintech center, right? So you have mm -hmm. a lot of your large investment banks, whether it's Morgan Stanley or Bank of America or you know Merrill Lynch in the old days, Goldman Sachs. Deutsche Securities, all these companies have really large offices and have historically in Hong Kong. So financial fintech should be something that's really generated there. And I'm wondering if you see sort of a sector bias towards the in the startup ecosystem there that's skewed towards finance or, or is it really spread out amongst other types of businesses as well? Um, uh, you know, this whole thing with Singapore, actually, that is, uh, I think the media likes to play that up more than the actual reality. There is some friendly competition, sure, but sure, frankly, sure. I, I do see like us collaborating with Singapore is probably, you know, a much better thing for both our um, cities going forward, actually. And, uh, you know, I actually do meet with the, you know, quite a few different departments within you know, the Singapore government, and, and they're incredibly supportive and, and you know, really um, proactive. And of course, in certain areas, we are certainly trying to attract the best and the brightest. But I do think that, um, you know, companies select a place, a base based on business fundamentals at the end of the day, sure. you know, and, and I think at the there a lot of the entrepreneurs and founders are smart enough to understand what the various benefits of those respective places are. Um, saying that, I do think um, Hong Kong, you know, we we are one of the, the financial capitals of the world. There's no doubt about it. But I think we're also, um, you know, the financial services are skewed towards certain types of um, sub-industries. Um, you know, the, the, the trade financing, for example, it's, you know, Hong Kong has always been and will probably remain 
mean? So for foreseeable future, the gateway to and from China. So all these currency kind of exchanges in terms of the trade finance and when you're actually working with China, you know, there's a, a massive, massive um, group of people who are involved in that kind of space. So I think even going forward in terms of fintech, we are seeing more of these types of companies that are leveraging the, the actual um, the market access and the market opportunities um, here. Um, that notwithstanding, we are sort of like focused on, on other subsectors of fintech as well that we think make a lot of sense for, for Hong Kong. And this, this includes like, um, you know, um, cyber security. This includes like the the currency controls and, and exchanges. Also, the, the B2B side of things, I think, you know, the, the KYC, know your customers, all these compliance issues, and also insure tech, actually. We're, we're seeing quite a lot of growth into that space as well. But fintech is, you know, undisputedly a very big area within the, the economy of Hong Kong. But if you look at the, the kind of um, industries that startups are involved in, in in Hong Kong, and we do do a survey every year um, to look at what people are doing, it's actually very, very diverse. You know, we've got some um, companies involved in obviously the e-commerce side, the logistics supply chain. We're seeing a bunch of um, companies involved in the hardware space, which is actually quite natural for us, obviously, with mm. Shenzhen on our doorstep. Um, we're actually seeing quite um, a lot of movement within the, the biotech as well as the retail tech industries as well. So, um, you know, we're expecting to see a lot more development in that kind of space, really. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would think so, right? And I guess that was the other question I was going to ask you is as the gateway to China and with Shenzhen, mm -hmm. which is the manufacturing base and sort of the mm -hmm. creation center for so many, not just, not just technology development, but tech startups, are you yes. seeing, a, like, can you, can you give me an example just for me, like, <clears throat> what type of hardware type things you're seeing coming out of sort of the relationship that Hong Kong has with Shenzhen? And, mm. and, and how to, like, if a company is, is either A, in Shenzhen or B, outside, but wants to come in and expand, how do you, mm. help, how do you help them? Like, how does that okay. work? Okay. Sure. Um, so just to uh, answer your first part of the question, basically, what kind of companies are we seeing? You know, as we all know, Shenzhen has really moved up that value chain in terms of manufacturing these days. And it's not really about your average small widgets. That, no, that, no, 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 not at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the kind of things that we're seeing and certainly the kind of companies that are coming to Hong Kong because of that proximity to Shenzhen for manufacturing is on the, the consumer IoT side of things. So, for example, you've got, you know, your your smart bicycle helmets or your smart alarm clocks that basically quantifies um, a whole bunch of other kind of um, measurements as well. Um, so we're seeing quite a lot in terms of the consumer tech side, but we're also seeing quite a bit of movement within the really specialised, what we call the health tech slash wearables kind of space as well. So it's not just your, you know, your nice to have kind of wearables, but we're seeing quite serious kind of um, health tech items, whether we're talking about certain types of prosthetics um, that have sensors built in or we are seeing um you know, some kind of hard devices almost, you know, that they that, that people are also looking into. And Shenzhen, actually, in addition to, you know, your, your mass kind of um, high value manufacturing, also has some niche players that can really, really deliver on some very, very technically advanced kind of health tech products. And we're seeing some of those actually come to the fore as well um, within Hong Kong. Um, in terms of actually, company. So, so you know, we, we do see that whole proximity to Shenzhen thing to be a massive advantage for Hong Kong sure. and for businesses here. Uh, and that's why we've actually tried to formalize it slightly with, um, with the, the development of the loop, um, which is basically effectively a, a massive area that was before a little bit of like a border between China and, and Hong Kong. Now, that space was pretty much left empty because, you know, we needed a physical kind of delineation between the, the two territories. But, you know, because of all these latest developments and because of the fact that we are so much closer now to China, we thought we'd actually turn that space into what we hope to be a massively innovative high-tech hub where we can attract some of these best kind of thought leaders and, and some of the top universities from around the world to actually come, as well as some of these 
these these massive Chinese companies that we're obviously seeing a lot of you know impact um, on a global kind of level be based here, and that's going to be managed under the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, which is already you know running a, a massive um, science park space in the new ter- in the new territories within them. Um, uh, Hong Kong. And the idea for that is that that will be a little bit of a like a sandbox kind of space um, where we hope that we can basically lower, um, you know, criteria for access from people in China back and forth and also from other countries as well. And hopefully also in the kind of things that they can develop. Um, so instead of just a sandbox being applied to in fintech, you know, we might extend that to other kind of um, industries and things. But, you know, this, this is very, very early days. And, you know, this is the preliminary information. But suffice to say that we actually see those opportunities with Shenzhen to be, you know, massively beneficial for both sides, which is why it's been recognised in the development of this loop. Um, there's also going to be... Um, the high-speed rail that's going to be launching in the third quarter of next year between, and, um, between Hong Kong, the centre of Hong Kong, to Shenzhen, to Guangzhou, and Guangdong, and then subsequently to the rest of the China's high-speed rail system. Really? But it means, yeah. So let me, so let me understand. So, it, so from where? So from? So from um, Kowloon. Yep. In um, in Hong Kong, which you know you might know, Very it's well. um, it's yeah exactly. So from there, right in the center of Hong Kong, you would be able to get from there to Shenzhen in fourteen minutes, one four. 14 you know that's minutes? going to be. In 14 minutes, that's going to be quicker than effectively walking from one end of the street to another end of the street in some areas of Hong Kong. So we're talking about, you know, a, a pretty tight integration. And we see that, you know, the, the kind of business benefits, if you've, you're a startup and you're doing, you know, all your rapid prototyping and you're doing the initial kind of developments in, in Shenzhen, you know, but you still want to see your, all your investors or you want to have your IP protection in Hong Kong. It's, it's very doable. We're literally talking about hopping onto a train. 15 minutes later, you're in Shenzhen. Um, so it actually makes that, you know, a, a very kind of straightforward kind of process, actually. And not to mention the fact that when you tie it in within the, the rest of the high speed um, network within China, you know, you know, everything is just going to be that much more accessible, I think. How far is that? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look on a map to see how far mm. it is from Hong Kong to, from Kowloon. Well, to sure. Shenzhen. Well, as, as a reference point at the moment, we do have a train that, you know, a regular train yeah, that about. takes us from, yeah, that basically takes us from um, Hong Kong, which is a, another part of, um, you mm-hmm. know, the Hong Kowloon Hong, yeah. Peninsula, over to Shenzhen. And that'll probably take you a bit close to about an hour and a bit. Wow. So you're really cutting so that in you, fourths. In yeah. Fourth, yeah. I mean, bringing it down to something like 15 minutes, I mean, psychologically, I think it makes a big difference. It's, it's like just going to another district within Hong Kong. And, you know, it's it's um, it's just going to make it that much easier, I think, if you're looking to, to access some of these these you know, the, the rapid prototyping, as I mentioned, or these other kind of like markets you get in, in Shenzhen that, you know, showcases the most fantastic uh, latest tech. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to make that whole IoT hardware and med tech um, space to be quite an interesting growth area in, in years to come, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fascinating. I'm just looking at the distances on the map. It's pretty far mm-hmm. away and to be able to go by train there in 15 or 14 minutes. Yeah, is nothing short of incredible. It goes right through the new territories and right into you know through the beginning of Guangdong and then into Shenzhen. It's pretty interesting. Um, yes. So, and the second part of that question was, <clears throat> um, you know, I'm a startup. Let's say I'm based in Australia mm. or I'm based yeah. in or I'm based in even Thailand, and I want to expand right. to into the Hong Kong market. I'm in fintech or insurtech or even in some kind of manufacturing technology, mm. and I call Start Me Up Hong Kong. Mm. What what's the conversation like? Um, it's, it's, you and know, I know it's different we, for every business, but I'm just really yeah. curious, right? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and we do talk to people all the time from all over the world, actually. A lot of it at the beginning is it's basically finding out, um, you know, what kind of industry, what kind of support they require. You know, you've got companies who are, um, you know, maybe quite established already overseas. And, and what they're looking for is just maybe some market access information. How big is the potential for me in this market? Or, you know, for my type of R&D, am I likely to get any kind of financial support? Or, or, you know, are there many people looking for this type of, of service? Um, you know, even within the startup industry, we've got something like health tech or, or um, education tech that people ask these kind of questions. So we basically give them some kind of background. We get them connected to different people. Now, if they are then looking to the next step of actually coming to Hong Kong um, and, and just checking out the, the potential to opportunities, um, then we would actually, you know, obviously meet up with them and provide them a, a bit more in-depth kind of information. But we also get them connected to various stakeholders. So if you were in health tech, for example, and you've got, uh, you know, you're wondering whether there's any kind of cool workspaces or if there's any kind of incubation or acceleration programs um, that might be relevant for you or would you have some people that you can connect to and you know more part of the, the health tech system so you can just understand what's going on on the ground you know we would make those kind of link ups or make those kind of introductions um, you know some people do ask us about funding actually you know hooking them up with investors and by and large that's not something we directly get involved in right. just because it requires a level of endorsement on the government side sure and we try to maintain to you know a little bit of a neutral kind of position um but what we do do is refer them to networks you know investment networks like we've got the the hkvca we've got the the business angel association and there's quite a few of these different kind of groups that um you know that are really quite welcoming actually especially if you've got something that's a bit of a game changer so we'll do these kind of things. And if required, we will also, you know, invite them certain events whereby we can actually put some of these people together. And then if they decide to to get together and do deals and things, that, that's like their, their business decision. So the kind of help we provide just ranges. It really does um, from really basic stuff to actually quite deep kind of, um, you know, where can I hire a full stack developer at this kind of experience? You know, we've got some people that we know um, that we, we can refer or other networks as well so it's a little bit of both but when in terms of um you know once they're actually here on the ground we can get them you know help them with their pr we can actually include the information in our newsletters which goes out to about something like thirty thousand people around the world um you know we can help them with the press releases if relevant we can also get them to speak at um, some of the events that we organize and things like that so so we, we try to offer quite a lot of like hand holding at those kind of early stages um, you know the the government funding is another area that is um, you know there's a lot of interest because, right tell me tell me how that works yeah. Well, actually, you know, our, our funding schemes tend to be skewed towards areas that we think there's the gaps in the market. I mean, by and large, the Hong Kong government isn't one of those types that may potentially just directly fund startups or other types of companies. And what we try and do is basically build a very strong kind of infrastructure to support startups growth. That means that we put a lot of money into Cyberport and, and Hong Kong Science and Technology Park because those are actually publicly funded, but they're privately run. So they have a lot more autonomy as to the kind of support they can offer. They've got these, you know, macro funding schemes. They are, you know, massive accelerators and incubators. Um, they've got a bunch of investors based in their, their offices as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of support put into there. Other areas of support is in the financial support is in and R&D. So um, we offer a whole bunch of different kind of funding schemes if you are uh, looking to do R&D here, here in Hong Kong. You know, for example, the Enterprise Support Scheme is actually, you know, a, a really good program. It's basically a matching grant that pays up to 1.2 million US per project on a matching basis that the government takes absolutely no equity in. I mean, there is definitely a step that you have to go through in order to apply for this kind of funding. And, you know, it will be peer reviewed and you will be um, interviewed and things like that. But once you actually get it, the actual funding itself is actually very, very generous and actually de-risks a lot of that kind of um you know, investment into your, your product or your technology. Other areas that we try to basically plug is, um, you know, where 
we hear a lot of startups saying that, you know, a lot of these companies are not willing to try this new technology or new services and products because, frankly, it's a, it's a bit of a risk when a startup doesn't have a, a long track record. Right. So we've basically launched another program called um, the Technology Voucher Scheme, whereby we basically give the clients who are, you know, basically uh, – buying some of this technology or commissioning, uh, you know, the, some of those services and bringing it in-house to enhance the operations, we pay those guys up to 200,000 Hong Kong um, to basically, again, de-risk that and encourage them to actually adopt new technologies. Wow, um, that's so a, it's, it's an interesting take on how to, get, so instead of going the funding route, in other words, instead of mm, giving money to the company developing the technology, mm, you're essentially funding their clients to be able to go out and not, not, not the clients per se, but you're giving yeah. the clients money and saying, here, we're going to, dis- them, we're going to disintermediate yeah. Yeah, the financial risk for you and mm. encourage you to spend this money, which we've allocated to you, to use on a startup company's new service. So it costs you nothing. We'll pay for it. The startup gets yeah. to make some income mm. and everybody benefits in the sense that the new products get um, tried, they get exposure. Yeah. And they mm. get feedback from potential clients, and the clients spend nothing doing it, but everybody kind of benefits in a way, or nobody loses anything, to be fair. It's an interesting take on how governments encourage the startup ecosystem, which is different than kind of what other governments are doing, but interesting as well, I thought. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to look at slightly different ways. I mean, we really do listen to the startups. I mean, I literally meet so many on a regular basis, as do our different kind of um, government departments. And we've really listened to where the pain points are and try to plug in some of those gaps. Just going back to the technology voucher scheme, I mean, there are specific criteria. It's not a case of just, sure, just giving it up. No, no, no. Yeah, but, but absolutely. It's, it's a way of actually encouraging some of these, you know, traditional companies to give startups startups that go and not just startups actually we're talking SMEs as well if they've got something that's really innovative and can enhance you know the the operations of a company in some way then it's something that we also want to encourage now where there are slightly um, funding gaps um, we also try to we've just basically um launched a new VC matching scheme that was announced in the the budget speech last year by our financial secretary at the time. And what that is, is that for accredited VCs, um, the Hong Kong government will match on a one to two basis um, the funding that VCs are putting into startups. How does that work? Exactly. In other words, one to two means if I'm a venture capitalist and I put in $100,000, the government will put in Mm. 200 or vice versa? So it's vice versa. So we'll put in 50,000, for example, if the VC is putting in 100,000. Interesting. Now, the, yeah, the details have not actually been exactly rolled out. We're expecting to see that quite soon. But certainly in my discussions with the, the relevant department, the Innovation and Technology Commission, who's responsible for dispersing that, um, we're talking about, you know, as long as that, that startup um, that they're investing in has uh, you know, either Hong Kong based or is actually very connected to Hong Kong in some way and so would be looking to um, expand and, and do business in Hong Kong, um, then you know they can potentially qualify for, for this matching basis. And basically the, the matching would be on exactly the same terms as the VC. So the VC has like um you know you know X percentage for X amount of money, then for half that amount we expect to get half that amount of equity. So you are taking example. equity. So you would be taking equity or the government would be taking equity. Again, a very we different would be. approach. Huh, very yes. interesting. And and when do you expect that plan to roll out? Very quickly, actually. So it's been sort of like a lot of discussion and back and forth. And actually, I know that ITC have been meeting with a, a lot of different um, VCs as well as angel investors because actually we've aligned a lot of those kind of meetings. And I know they've got some great feedback and insights onto how the VC and you know community would like to see this working. So they're still polishing off the, the details of it, but we're expecting this to be you know rolled out certainly within Q3 of, of, of this year. Okay, that's pretty soon. Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about, so there are two startups that come to mind for me when I think about Hong Kong and companies mm. that have grown, you know, very nicely, actually. One of them is Lala Move. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. I am, yep. And then the other one is Grana. I don't know if you heard mm. of Grana as well. Yeah, yeah, actually, um, yeah, Luke Grana, actually, is a big fan of Invest Hong Kong. So do you want to talk about, individually or even as a whole, like, 
Mm. Lala Move is a company which is going to do most of its business <laughs> out, outside of Hong Kong, but started there, yes. funded by a company called Mindworks, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Yes, that's, that's right. A, yep. David, David, Cha- David Chang, yeah. David Chang yep. entity, right, along with three of his other co-founders. So I know David relatively well, but I'm really curious from your perspective, from the mm. Start Me Up Hong Kong perspective, what do you think drove a company like Lala Move, which again is going to do most of its business outside of Hong Kong, to start there and then expand into the rest of all of Asia, really, because, you know, I mm. ride around on my Vespa in mm. Bangkok and I see Lala move um, scooters everywhere. So I'm just curious on that. And then I want to get to Grana as well in a second, because I have some other questions. They're very different businesses, right? Yes, they are. They are. I mean, the logistics sector in Hong Kong has always been very, very well developed, actually. Right. Had to be. Um, you might, yeah, you might know that Hong Kong International Airport is the biggest cargo airport in the world. I mean, the throughput um, that it goes through is, is massive, which means that actually talent wise, it's always been, a, you know, a very, very it is strong industry here and talent wise there are quite a lot of people with expertise in logistics right. here and I think with the Lala Move guys it was very much um, I actually don't know the actual individuals that well um, but it was a case of just you know coming from that kind of background and recognizing the opportunities here um, you know we, we started seeing similar kind of kind of businesses and, and other where you know developed markets but there was nothing in Asia as yet at the time that we knew of or, or those guys saw um, that you know that that was actually really shaping up the shaking up the space. So you know they decided to to try it, it in Hong Kong. And the thing about Hong Kong is it's, it's a great test market. You know it's sure. seven million people. It's very very dense and it's, it's actually got a population that's very very ta- tech savvy and very open to new tech as well. So it was a great place to try something there and refine that business model. And then of course once you've got that, then you can basically apply it to different markets. Even though you know the Asia is is very fragmented and, and each country is very different, I think fundamentally, um, if you've got the service right and, and also you you know uh, your your missions about the delivery and what you're hoping to achieve, and you basically ad- adapt it to the, uh, the proper market conditions in each country, then the expansion thing is is doable. It's just that you know I think having a benefit of being in Hong Kong and just being in Asia, you realise how different each Asian country is, For sure. and being able to you know understand that and, and basically get the on the ground expertise. I think um, you know it, it stands while I'm moving in a really good stead and you know I certainly think that they are they're definitely poised for for big things happening actually they which are. you probably know about from from discussions with David <laughs> yeah I don't have any inside information from David but I will say this I follow Lala move on my own and I was really curious as to why that company started mm. in Hong Kong but you're right I mean you have to remember my first trip to um, Hong Kong I'm gonna mispronounce this possibly but was I landed at Kai Tech Airport and mm-hmm. I remember when the new Hong Kong airport was being developed and just how that changed. I remember Hong Kong was one of the first cities in Asia with a deep water port, so it did a lot of the <clears throat> sort of shipping as well. Um, yeah. It's been one of, you know, logistics obviously, as you say, has been one of Hong Kong's sort of secret strong points forever. And I, yeah. guess, and I guess that kind of gets me to Grana as well, right? So mm. Australian brothers, yeah. uh, they must have some kind of history in Hong Kong as well, and I, I haven't done enough work on that to be sure. But... You know, again, they're taking a textile business, essentially, turning it into yeah. a fashion business and then putting some tech around it. But again, why do you think that that's – what's your view on why that's based in Hong Kong? And do, will they see people emulate them, do you think, from just from a – you know, Hong Kong's the best place to start this kind of business perspective? Or is this mm. a, just a unique one-off and they just happened to be there at the time when they started this? Like, What's your view on Grana anyway? Well, the, the, the story actually from, from the, the Grana guys, from Luke basically, was that, you know, he basically went to different countries in South America when his brother was based and he saw some fantastic textiles and things. And he thought oh, it would be a, a great opportunity to set up a new business to create good basic um, clothing using fantastic textiles, cut out the middlemen and, you know, offer them direct to the to the consumer at much, um, much reduced prices compared to what you would normally get charged for that kind of quality. And when he actually thought about this, he, you know, he did quite a lot of homework. He actually approached our office in, in, um, in Australia, in Sydney, and, um, 
you know, talked to quite a few different people, um, both in, at Invest Hong Kong and also the other kind of countries as well, the representatives there. And he decided that Hong Kong was the best place for him. So he basically just packed his bags, came to Hong Kong and decided Hong Kong was where he wanted to run it. And the reason why he chose Hong Kong um, was, was, was several fold. I mean, basically the, the textiles um, background. So Hong Kong was still very much involved in, in the textile side, you know, during the 60s and 70s, actually manufactured here. And of course, a lot of that moved to, to China later on in, in the 80s and the 90s. But there was still a lot of the, the factory owners um, you know, involved in the, the Pearl River Delta were actually owned by Hong Kong factory owners. Sure. And they, you know, and they were very interested in this kind of space. Again, the whole experience and talent and, you know, uh, expertise were here that he can also leverage as well. The proximity to um, to Shenzhen and Guangdong and other areas that could potentially be manufacturing hubs, he thought was very useful. And actually, the logistics side of things was one of the main reasons why I um, look, decided to sit up here too. And, um, you know, if you hear him talk at various events, he's been very complimentary. I think um, the team that was dealing with him, our consumer products team, there's a, a lady called Maki, and she basically did so much in terms of, you know, helping him get connected to different people, um, you know, including some of the, the big fashion groups and, and some other, um, you know, relevant kind of stakeholders. And then, of course, he was one of the earliest ones to actually decide side on, on these kind of products and things and correspondingly there was a lot of interest on, on um, the investor front and I think he's actually done very very well in terms of the kind of investors he's got on board you know I don't know whether you heard recently he also got invested in by um, by Alibaba the entrepreneurship yeah. fund as well yeah, I so saw he, that. He, he's, yeah he's doing really well and um, you know the sales wise his, his sales figures are fantastic I I don't know whether you've actually ordered any products from them, but they are actually really nice. Are you advertising? I, I, You're advertising I'm now. Their stuff, I, and I actually buy it for for my family back home. It's just it's it's quite basic kind of things. It's like um you know a shirt or a t-shirt, but it's just the fabrics are just gorgeous and the price points are, you know, are, are very attractive. So it's um, I think I'm going to give this. Got, I'm going to give this little piece of the clip to the guys at Grana and just say, just play this for your. You just had Jane give you a great advertisement, but it, to me, to I me, this is it. yeah. It, I mean, and it sounds like great stuff, right? To me, this sounds mm -hmm. like the natural evolution of what started back in 1994, right? When Shanghai mm -hmm. Tang said, "We're going to start a luxury brand in China." I mean, not in China, mm -hmm. but in Hong Kong, because mm -hmm. we're tired of you know Chanel, Gucci, and all these other companies coming in to our market and saying we're the only brand you can buy. So mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. a, it's seems to me like a 20-year history of like a natural progression into, wait a second, if all of these things are being manufactured here and if we have access to all the best materials, shouldn't we build mm. this business here? So it's great to see um, Grana actually doing that. Now, you said something, you just said something really interesting, and I kind of want to end on this if it's okay with you. You said, I sent it to my family back home. Mm. What does back home mean? <laughs> Back home is, is in Scotland, actually. I was raised in Scotland, and um, my parents are still back there. My siblings are all there. In fact, um, you know, aside from one cousin, um, I, I'm the only person from my family over there. You're, over so here, sorry. So you're, the only <laughs> you're the only person from your family that lives in... Is your family originally from Hong Kong? Yes, they are. They are. Um, they're from Hong Kong. They, you know, they emigrated... Um, in the in the seventies, and and basically, I was raised there. I was actually born in Hong Kong, for sure. But I went over there when I was um very young, and um you know I, I suppose I still do see Scotland as home. Yeah, I don't know what else to say except that's nothing short of amazing as well. You must get a <laughs> you must get a lot of sort of initial confusion from people, which we don't really need to talk about. But again, to me, right? I mean, part of the whole reason for talking is that the story around the person actually is sometimes more important than the, the individual things that that person is doing. And I do find it fascinating that you've come home is maybe the wrong word, but come back to the yes. place where your family is originally from. Like, mm. What drives you, if, if, your rest of, if the rest of your family is still mm, not just mm. in Edinburgh but in Scotland, mm. what made you decide to sort of come back to Hong Kong? 
Oh, it's, it's a bit of a funny story, actually. Tell me. You know, I, I was supposed to be going to to Spain. I had a job lined up in Spain. I was um, I was interning at um at IBM when I was a student, and um, you know, I was supposed to to basically go and join them at um, the Bilbao at the Geographical Information Systems wow. place. But um, I came back because my sister was here for a short time for a holiday, and uh, my parents thought it was a really good move for me to to. You know, I was too westernized and I needed to understand my roots a little bit more. So, um, you know, off I trotted to Hong Kong and, um, you know, 22 years later, I'm still here. And my parents are now saying, like, when are you coming, coming home? home right? <laughs> yes. Please go back and understand where your roots are, but please don't stay there for 22 years. I think we've all been. Yeah, exactly, through. exactly. But now, of course, my, my whole family, my own family is here. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's a great place. Hong Kong is, is very dynamic and, um, um, with the startup ecosystem, this explosion that's happening, it's um, it's a very exciting place to be in. And I, I do encourage you to come, potentially come and set up on a business here. Right. So, I mean, I have a company that is actually based mm-hmm. in Hong Kong. And a lot of the sort of startups that we, we meaning the people with, with whom and in whom I invested in Thailand, a lot of their parent companies are, are set up in Hong Kong, right? I mean, one of the things that Hong Kong offers besides its proximity to China, um, mm. which is, uh, you know, enough really for me at any level. But, mm. you know, it's easy to set up a company there. The corporate laws are laws that people understand. It's based on an mm. English, English legal system. I don't <laughs> just mean the language. I mean the English, UK. Common law system. Yeah, common yeah. law system, yeah. right, which I think mm-hmm. is re- a really powerful um, lure as well. Yes. Um, but it also has, you know, centuries-long history of, you know, being friendly to foreigners, whatever that means, right? In mm-hmm. other words, mm-hmm. you can survive and thrive in Hong Kong whether you're Chinese or Hong Kong Chinese or not. And I think that's a great, I mean, and and again, Singapore is the same way, right? So both of these places Mm. are very um, open to, you know, foreigners coming in and starting companies. And like you Mm -hmm. said, at the beginning, I I sort of asked a little bit tongue in cheek, like about a 30 year competition. And it's, again, Mm. it's friendly, right? Because it's family. Mm -hmm. It's the same way you're competitive with your sister, but you don't want anything Mm. bad to happen to her per se. And I think it's kind of the same. No, exactly. It's kind of the same way. Mm. yeah, and I, look, I think it's interesting the fact that you've not only have you come home in a way, but you've come home and gone into the most dynamic sector of the economy as well. And I think that's really interesting too. Well, thank you. Um, actually, can I also just very quickly please. just mention a couple of the uh, the festivals we've got running as well that please I would do. love to, no, please to get that really information important. to your audience. Um, we have FinTech Week happening, which is going to run from the 23rd to the 27th of October. Okay. It's going to be our second um, FinTech Week and it's um, being organized by our FinTech team. And it's going to be a whole week of really quite dynamic events. Um, you know, we've got ex- an exchange running a, a few days. We've got Finno Asia running a few days. They're bringing in some giants within the fintech stage um, from China, from you know, from Israel, from the US, and also our regulators have got a day where they're going to be bringing a lot of the you know the the compliance and the regulation a tech. Um, experts to cut to come and, and chat as well so we would love to see people within the fintech space to potentially come and attend that because it's a great opportunity to network with that group of people the second one of course is the start me up festival um this is the one that i, I was mentioning evolved from the the venture form this competition that we had right. and now it's becoming a, a week-long event and we are basically focused on uh, events that are and, and sectors that we think Hong Kong really does have a chance to compete on a global level. So we'll still have our own venture forum, the Sat Me Up Hong Kong Venture Forum, but we've also got um, KPMG running the Connected City, which is like a smart city event. Wow. We've got the FinTech Finals that's been organised by Next Change, um, sorry, Next Money. Um, we've got Retail's Cutting Edge, a retail tech event that's going to be organised by Inside Retail. It's like a 20-year veteran of, um, you know, retail publication. Um, we've got the Internet of Life, which is an IoT kind of event organized by Brink. And then we've also got an exchange running Health Tech Asia as well. And for our own venture forum, um, last year we had, uh, we were incredibly lucky to have Elon Musk as our keynote speaker. I saw um, that. Yeah, I mean, he was absolutely fantastic i mean everything you expect from like a real visionary and more and more um this year and more and this year we had like brett king as well as like a, a fantastic tech illusionist called marco tempest so you know we really run the gamut of different types of speakers and next year um in um 
from the, on the 29th of January, we are building our own programs and we've got some really, really high level speakers, which I can't announce yet because I'm not allowed to, no but it's, it's, it's going to be really, really interesting. And we would love to see people from around the region to potentially come over and, you know, network, get connected and, um, you know, just, just understand a little bit more about the ecosystem here. Super. Look, Jane, I really want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank you for giving us a ton of really interesting information and also for allowing yourself to highlight the festivals that not only you'll be doing, but that some of your partners will be doing in Hong Kong. I think that the uh, listeners will find that super useful. So thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.